What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Phil and Will Show. We are here, and we are going to be talking all about a lot of things today, including my debacle of a bracket, uh, Sweet 16 predictions, Will wanting to pick Oakland blindly and it working out. I don't even think he realized that was Oakland, Michigan, not Oakland Bay Area, where he is from. Uh, we're going to be talking about NFL I rules. when we talked about it, it was like we landed, it was in like Missouri. <laughs> it was like Michigan. Even, huh? even on the, the Phil and Will Show last week, and that was actually the video where we had to, uh, the the breakdown by uh, mm -hmm. like ESPN Calipari, I think. No, Joe Lenardi. Lenard. Lenardi. Yeah. Yes, Lenardi's now at ESPN. Yeah. yeah, we'll be talking about that. We'll be talking about terrible new NFL rules, and we're going to be also mentioning the fact that two Survivor winners were just announced in casts, about to be uh, on TV again, coming up here, uh, May 9th, and then sometime we don't know when for House Villains, but Richard Hatch. Just announced on that. So a lot to talk about on this week's Phil and Will show. It used to be, Will, what topics can we come up with? Now, all of a sudden, I feel like do we have so many topics we don't know what to do with ourselves. We've got three big topics. Uh, Sweet 16 preview, football rules, and then I don't even know what the topic is other than we just kind of briefly touch on that we have two Survivor winners gracing our screens in 2024 in some capacity. So, um but yeah, what do you want to start with first here, Phil? I think we should I think we should start with the reality TV news because I think it's the smallest news and then I think we move into the, okay. the bigger news which is sports and what everybody's who's probably listening to the Phil show what Phil and Will show is dying to hear anyway, right. which is about the sports. So let's keep everybody waiting a little bit longer so that I can have my uh my last moments of serenity before I have to talk about my final four that I picked on my bracket. So, um we have a brand new reality TV show coming out and mm -hmm. Wendell Holland is I will be honest the only person I've heard of on this cast that is claiming is going to be there they are going to pick the goat of reality television will I would even I've been hearing a lot about this show I've actually I have a lot of friends that worked on this show so um I knew this was coming I was wondering why it was taking so long for it to come out I've yet to watch the trailer or really see the cast uh, Look at the trailer right now. You're going to look at the trailer right now? Yes. Daniel Tosh is the host. I'm going to I'm gonna go through this while Will watches the trailer. Daniel Tosh is the host. We have, um, uh, like I said, I am probably the worst person to be asking for this because I don't watch that much reality TV. It's really Survivor and then whatever we cover. For a reality podcast. TV podcast, yeah, you don't watch any reality TV. We really, but we really only watch the competition shows, and this show doesn't really seem like it has a lot of competition based people. Uh, Reza is on there, I only know him because he was on The Traders. I can't tell you what his first show was, Shaws of Sunset. So, there you go. Um, he's gonna be on there. We also have Tech Holmes, Kristen, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say last name, Joey Sasso, Paolo, Paula Mayfield, Jill Zarin, CJ Franco. These are all brand new words to me, Alyssa Edward. Mm. Devon Rogers. I feel like I know Devon Rogers. Why do I know Devon Rogers? The challenge. Okay. I know Devon Rogers. Um, Joe Amabile, Jason Smith, Tasha Adams, Lauren Speed. But Wendell, I saw Wendell pop up here and I was like, holy crap, there's Wendell. Good for him. Uh, how do you feel about this? Did you just watch anything or just in general? How do you feel about the fact that this show's existing? Um I don't know. The trailer seems like it's a, like, honestly, like a carbon copy of House of Villains. Like, I'm watching the trailer right now, like, with the producer interrupting Tosh when he says it's a $200 million prize and it's actually a $200,000 prize. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know most of these people. I only know Wendell. I'm kind of with you. And it's called The Goat. So it's like just trying to find the greatest reality TV contestant ever. That's, that's the goal. So it's, is it, is it house of heroes? Is that what we're kind of, is that what we're leaning towards or are there villains in this cast? I don't know. I don't know this cast very well at all to be honest. Yeah. I'm, I guess what I'm most surprised here is, so we have, we have um, Wendell on this series and Wendell kind of feels like an outlier when you start looking at everybody else. Cause here, Tasha is from the Bachelor franchise. Joe is from the Bachelor franchise and Dancing with the Stars. Kristen is Vanderpump Rules. Reza is Shaw's The Sunset. CJ Franco is F Boy Island. Tech is the real world and the challenge. Justin Johnson, Alyssa Edwards are RuPaul's Drag Race. Um, uh, 
Alyssa Edwards is RuPaul's Drag Race. It has it listed here as Justin Johnson slash Alyssa Edwards. But Alyssa Edwards is RuPaul's Drag Race. Paula Mayfield is 90 Day Fiance. Davon Rogers is Big Brother in the Challenge. Joey Sasso, The Circle and Perfect Match. Jason Smith. I like Holiday. Joey. I do know Joey from The Circle. He's very good. Okay. Like Joey Lord Lauren Speed Hamilton is Love is Blind, and Jill Zarin is The Real Housewives of New York City. For a competition show to only have three competition show-based players on it is kind of surprising. So Wendell, to me, feels like he's the one who sticks out. Am I wrong? No, I don't think you're wrong, and I think if the premise of the show is let's find out who – that's what he says in the tra trailer. Let's find out who's the best at this being on a reality TV show – and then you have a bunch of challenges. I don't know how they eliminate people or the format other than that they do clearly have challenges. Um, but I don't know. You should then have, I don't know. There's not really a connecting. There's not a connector for all these people, it seems like. And it's hard not to compare this to House of Villains just by the look and the feel and the tone and somewhat of the casting choices here. You know, they have someone from Survivor. They have someone from The Bachelor. They have someone from Vanderpump Rules. So it's like there is kind of a kinship here with these two shows, it feels like. But at least on House Villains, they're all tied together because they're villains. Like they're all mm -hmm. villains from their respective shows. Now we're just pulling people from docu-series, from competition series, from dating shows. It doesn't seem like there's any rhyme or reason why that group of people got together. Um but we'll see, I guess. I don't know. I don't know how the, do we know how the format works? Does it say in any of these articles? I didn't look, I didn't look too much into it. I was yeah. just, you know, I'm a big Wendell fan. I've always enjoyed Wendell. I loved him in Ghost Island, thought he was fun in Winners at War. He's been on mm -hmm. our podcast quite a few times. I mean, I, if you go to the Bryson One events, you're gonna have a good time. He's just he's a really, really nice guy. And I'm really happy that he's back on reality tv in some way i feel like he's going to be light years ahead of everybody he's playing against on this but then at the same time it's like is it going to be a show where you can be light years ahead of people or no and that's always what the question is with a lot of these shows this is a prime video show um so prime video trying to dive deeper into the reality tv world yeah i mean this filmed over a year ago <laughs> yeah I, re I i remember i there's there's a number of people who worked on house of villains and then went to go they shot this in atlanta and they filmed it basically like a month after or two months after um so yeah i, I, don't, I don't really have i don't have too much else to say on this one phil i think you know we're that's fine minutes in. um the but another one we'll and i think the one that see. people are more excited for anyway is that hatch is back on tv and mm -hmm. that hatch is going to be on the new season of house of villains uh, the only Survivor player on there. Uh, they had Johnny Fairplay on season one. Now we're going to have a winner in Richard Hatch on season two. I think Survivor fans are going to be really stoked for this. Because as great as Wendell is, Wendell has been, you know, he did his own HGTV show. He's he's around in the community a lot more. I feel like Wendell is more accessible. And we saw him play twice from seasons 36 through 40. Hatch, it's been a long time. And when he didn't get put on winners at war for whatever reasons it was i think people were really bummed and now we get to see him play another game even though it's not survivor it's still going to be a lot of fun to have him on screen so i'm excited for season two of house of villains maybe now i'll actually finish season one of house of villains don't you tell johnny bear i haven't yet should. um but i'm excited i'm excited that richard hatch is going to be on there and i think the cast for house of villains season two is much stronger than the goat and i feel like that's just maybe the nature of the beast and what it's on. I don't know. But uh, New York getting the call back too. So <laughs> Richard Hatch will get to hang out with New York the same way Johnny Fairplay did. And um, yeah, I'm excited for that. I really am. Yeah. I might have known about the House of Villains yeah. 2 cast. I might have known a little bit. Um, yeah, no, I think, I, think, uh, I think it's good that Survivor, it seems like any show where they are bringing in reality stars to build up a cast, whether it's the Traders season one, where it was half and half, or the Traders season two, or House of Villains season one and two, or this show called The Goat, or Deal or No Deal Island. You know, all these mm -hmm. shows have a representative from Survivor, and it just goes to show how big the fan base still is and how these names can attract audiences. Um, and there's probably people on these other, like we don't really watch the challenge, but um, we do have people from the challenge on the traders on house of villains season one house of villains season two on the goat not on deal or no deal island but it's like these big franchises with these big characters clearly 
um it's working that's why they keep pulling from these same franchises to build up these kind of reality tv all-star cast that's where so many of the casting decisions are going and we discussed that with dealer no deal island whether a season two of that are they just going to do all former reality stars because there's enough shows that are established formats where okay i can watch this show because i like it for what it is i don't need to like the people before i watch it Survivor, mm -hmm. perfect example. We're now in our sixth straight season of full new cast members, aside from, you know, the one Bruce appearance. Yeah. Um, and so we watch Survivor because we like the game of Survivor. We like the format of the show. We like Jeff. We like how it works. And we don't need to know the characters going in. But it's been on for 25 years. Um, it's been on forever. It's in its 46th season, as I just said. So if you're a season one show, you can't just put... 16 to 20 random strangers together that no one knows that's going to be really hard to get an audience for and survivor had the luxury of being one of the first shows to do that and same with the challenge and same with big brother and same with the bachelor you know that's why these franchises are continued to be pulled from because those shows can sustain fully new cast members because their formats have such big audiences whereas like i think for a new show to come out and be all new person cast and really succeed the format has to be so so strong like when's the last time that has happened i mean the traders i guess you could say it, it did half and half and now the traders is kind of like a certified hit when it comes to reality competition shows but i mean most of these new shows they do not last um like can you think of any like a new show that no, has come out and I think what's funny about that is back in 2000, when Survivor came out, back in the 90s, when you get like the real world and you get road rules and all of those games, I think people were more infatuated with the idea of, oh, anybody can be on reality TV. Anybody can be on reality TV. And now reality TV stars have become like movie stars, where it's it's almost like you get them into the studio system from back in like the 20s, 30s, 40s, where, hey... You're one of our NBC guys now, so we just want to get you on any NBC affiliated show or, you know, would you be interested? And you're seeing people like Sari and Sandra and Stephanie uh, go on all these different shows. And now Wendell's doing the same. Hatch is doing the same. Johnny Fairplay did it. We're seeing it across the board now where it, I think audiences are more interested in we were never going to get celebrity versions of a lot of these shows. So now they've almost made celebrities out of the people that they really, really, really like anyway. And it is hard to convince people that a show about 20 strangers that you don't know is more compelling than watching 20 people that you know, but you've never seen interact. You're almost more excited to watch them all interact with each other. And all of reality TV shows have essentially become all-star games. That's really what it feels like. Yeah, and I, I think the studio system with the movie stars is kind of, it's a good analogy where I think it falls a little short is that these players aren't really signing non-competes. It doesn't feel mm -hmm. like it. Um, I know Netflix has done some stuff where it's like, okay, they, they have a ton of reality shows. They have The Circle, they have The Mole, they have Love is Blind, um, they have The Trust, um, Floor is Lava, which is not really a reality show, but... Yeah. Um, and then they did this show called Perfect Match, where it's basically it took all their hot, good looking single people from all their formats and just threw them into one house and made a dating show out of it. And Netflix went that route. And Joey, who is on The Goat, um, who won season one of The Circle USA, he was on Perfect Match season one, but it doesn't seem like he has this like non compete clause or he is solely has this exclusive deal with netflix because now he's on an amazon show and we saw johnny bananas who's been with mtv forever on the challenge which is you know now owned by paramount viacom mm -hmm. paramount cbs all that that whole family of shows but now we've seen him on house of villains which is an nbc show um in the nbc umbrella on e and then on the traders which is also on peacock and nbc show so it's not like these players are being like signed to specific networks or yeah. studios and they're more free agents that just keep fielding their calls and keep going on these shows and we are seeing that and while while this is all happening phil and i think this is why this works we still have survivor we still have big brother we still have amazing race we still have the challenge which i know is a lot of returnees but about half every season i think it's like half new players you still have the bachelor you still have love is blind you still have all these shows 
that and hey maybe blood is blind is the most recent one to be like a really new format without any type of returning people i mean the circle has done pretty well too i think i think netflix has had some hits um those shows are continuing to to go um and those mm. will produce the new players who become stars and then what you see from a lot of these shows that when they bring people on, you want some, you want some people like Hatch, you want some people like Bear Play, you want some people like Bananas or Amorosa or like these, you know, OG um, reality TV names and faces. But you also want to mix people in from like the newer, more recent seasons, so you get a mix of an audience, right? So it's like you and yeah. me would recognize Hatch, but then you have all these all these other people being like, oh, Joey from the Circle is on the go, and he was just on Perfect Match. I, Joey, you know, he's been around for probably two or three years in the reality scene. People want to see him too. So I think, I think it's all, I think it's all working. Yeah, I, I think so too. And I, you know, I don't think we'll ever get another survivor type. Um, we've even discussed with the traders ever doing all newbie season in the U S probably not. We've seen deal or no deal Island have to stunt cast Boston Rob in there with an, uh, with everybody else being a newbie. Um, I'm here for it though. Like I'm excited to watch house of villains season two. I don't know if I'll ever watch the goat. I don't think the goat is going to be something we end up podcasting unless Wendell can convince me otherwise. Um, but I just, to me, it just feels like that's another, random reality tv show that maybe it will be a hit maybe i'll jump in at some point but it to me it just feels like okay like aside from wendell i don't know anybody else there with house of villains i know hatch and then with new york coming back even though i don't necessarily love new york i know that was her show you're welcome everybody um i do think like there there's more appeal there for me on that show plus i really saw the format work the first time and even though i didn't finish the season i did enjoy how it you was going in that first season. season i know um, and I think I think Blake and I may end up recapping House of Villains season two. He has not been told. There's no premiere date yet. We don't know any of that. We just know the cast. But I think that could be a good one for us to recap because he watches like RuPaul's Drag Race and he watches a lot of those other shows where I am very much like Survivor, Survivor, Survivor. So I can sit down. I can watch uh, Richard Hatch and be super excited. But he's going to know who, you know, all these other people are. Candy Muse um i don't think he watches the bachelor or anything but still uh he'll know jesse and yeah that'll be good and i know wes because i did watch one of his seasons of the challenge so anyway that's what's going on we got two winners of survivor coming on our screen soon we do know that the goat will be coming out may 9th that will be the first episode of that on amazon prime don't know if they're just going to dump them or if it's going to be week after week after week have no idea and then uh we don't know what the premiere date is yet for house of villains season two but that'll be fun richard hatch wendell holland both back on our screens even if i only watch highlight clips of the goat it better be wendell proving that he is the goat at least of that cast okay we need that so um yeah that's it if you guys are excited for those shows let us know because i am curious what you all think as survivor fans most of you primarily are survivor fans um what do you think about those two shows and are you excited for hatch and wendell to be back on screen also like this video subscribe to the channel we're 18 minutes in Figured I'd say it now. Let's talk about the NFL rules, Will. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, where do you want to start? Which rule? We have two major rule change changes. The hip drop tackle is the stupidest rule change in the history of the NFL. It's over. The NFL is done. You're you're going that strong. You can't tackle now. This is going to change the game permanently. Look, and I I understand that they're really basing this off of a lot of knee injuries come off of this. But if you can't hit high and you can't hit the hip drop tackle. Barstool Sports threw out a great video of all of these would-be illegal tackles in the new rules. Bro, they are the most generic, normal tackles. Are we trusting Barstool that they know? Okay, first of all, I don't need, I didn't even know what a hip, hip drop tackle It became known because of Mark was. Andrews this year when he got injured against whoever it was. So, I mean, for me... I kind of want to, this is kind of like a wait and see. I, I think this is one of those things that like sounds really, really bad. And maybe it is really bad. I'm not saying that it's not, but I'm, I'm willing to say, let's see how it's enforced and what constitutes it. Cause right now, and I think this is definitely the biggest problem of the rule. And at least for me, it seems like it's pretty subjective. Like you could just be like, you tackled him. Like, uh, like all these definition i've not once since this rule came out have i seen or read or heard or someone say explicitly and objectively 
what a hip drop tackle even is. Like, I don't know what it is. And so if you can't define it that easily, then how are you going to enforce it clearly and fairly? That's yeah. really my concern. I, but, I if it's, to... if, but but still, the, the NFL officials right now are going through, a, am sure, a rigorous training process to really define what it is. And I'm sure they, they have to be egregious versions of a hip drop tackle. And so I'm willing to wait and see, uh, you know, if it just looks like a normal tackle and they throw a flag and the player's like, what do you want me to do? Then, yeah, I think then NFL could be broken forever. However, if there's a very specific thing that they are looking for, like throwing your body into the knees um, or wrapping up the knees and falling on the knees, um, and it's super dialed in and specific and avoidable for the defensive player, then, hey, maybe we get fewer injuries, fantasy football becomes more fun, and we can avoid this tackle. I think the scary thing is when it becomes the only way to tackle someone if it falls into a hip drop tackle then what are you then the guy just gets to go to the end zone for free here's like okay so here we go are you ready i'm ready so i'm reading this off jory epstein i'm going from jory epstein over here at yahoo sports so that's who i'm looking at she put out an article on monday uh she's a senior nfl reporter over there here's what concerns me with this and this is how i know that it's gone too far the nfl has banned the hip drop tackle they are claiming it is only the swivel version We'll figure that out. We'll talk about maybe what the swivel is. Can but I find out what the But here is the concerning is? part. Here is the concerning part. Let Can me preface this thing, the... Will. Let me preface. I have – here's the concerning part. Okay? okay? Here's the concerning part. The NFL Players Association does not want this banned. The NFL Players Association, which is all about the health and safety of the players – they're the ones who don't want people getting headshots. They're the ones who are always talking about needing to improve helmets for CTE concerns and stuff like that. The NFL PA came out ahead of the owners meetings and they were against the proposal of banning this tackle saying we cannot support a rule change that causes confusion for us as players, for coaches, for officials, and especially for fans and dolphin safety. So these are the people J Javon Holland, Josh Metellus were among the first players to publicly weigh in on the world change and JJ Watt and Kenyon Drake joined in later. Nobody wants this rule actually changed. This is a media narrative rule change and the NFL owners are voting on it, thinking that it's going to be good. Maybe it's, it, it, it is going to result in more scoring significantly more scoring because on a lot of these plays, it is the only way you can bring this person down. And like you said, what are you supposed to just get seven points? That's going to be the result, or it's going to be a 15-yard penalty. I mean, here's here's what the guy says, right? So this is the actual rule. So I'm going to read this to you because these are the words. Thank you. It is a foul if a player uses the following technique to bring a runner to the ground. A, grabs the runner with both hands or wraps the runner with both arms. And B, unweights himself by swiveling and dropping his hips and or lower body landing on and trapping the runner's legs at or below the knee. It just, it's absolute nonsense. And so when asked how they were going to call this, like how they were going to train the officials, you only call it if the defender grabs an opponent and gets control, swivels him and unweighs him. So you have to basically as a Refs defender, don't even know what a catch is. If you but the way I'm interpreting this, and I could it could be wrong, is if both of your feet leave the ground as a defender, if you keep at least one foot on the ground, it seems like you're good because no, then you because have, the then you're team, not unweighting yourself. You're not unweighting yourself then. Unweighting yourself means jumping out to grab a player, and now the effect of gravity is going to pull your weight to the ground and you're wrapped around someone's lower body. And then you will probably fall or land on their knees or they will fall on their own knees or lots of ACLs and high ankle sprains. And I feel like as long as you stay, have at least one foot on the ground, that they cannot throw a flag. So here's what the problem is, though. The hip drop that is happening here, that is taking place, your feet a lot of times do stay on the ground as you do the hip drop. Because what you're doing is you're almost making your legs go limp. You're putting all the pressure on your upper body. So as you have the person wrapped, 
you're going and you just kind of like pull your weight to the ground with the person. So your feet are staying on the ground. It's, oh, you can't trap the legs. In an NFL game, how are you not trapping legs? Look, I hate watching. The but it doesn't. Legs. It says how you are you can, not trapping legs? It says you can. You. It seems like you can trap legs as long as you're not unweighting yourself. No, you cannot land on and trap the runner's legs at or below the knees. That, but that's part B. Or it says before that unweighting yourself. It seems like the unweighting yourself is a requirement of the flag. So, will. But here's my question to you. Okay, so I hear what you're saying, right? And I, I understand that you're trying I'm to discern this. I but am here's trying my to question. discern it. Here's my question. They pass interference always messed up. Holding always messed up. Personal fouls always messed up. This one in real time is going to be so ridiculously hard to enforce. Unbelievably hard. This is going to this is going to be a 2-year rule. Remember two years ago or three years ago or four years ago, whatever the hell it was, I think it was right after COVID, they had you could review pass interference and they realized, holy shit, that was the stupidest thing we ever did. They just topped it because now defenders can't go high. And here's the other problem, Will. So now you can't drop to pull your the person down. So let's say somebody's running away from you. Now you have to grab them and you can't drop your weight to bring them to the ground. But you also can't flip them because that's a personal foul. So what are you need to, if somebody's running away from you, you need to defy physics, run at that person so hard and catch them that you hit them perfectly and knock them forward onto the ground because you can no longer wrap them and pull them back. It's impossible. You can't flip them. I think you, you can wrap them. wrap them and pull them back. You can't because you're dropping your weight. But I think you have to unweight yourself. You keep saying the unweight yourself will define unweighting yourself. Go ahead. To me, if you're unweighting yourself, you are basically giving up your weight to gravity and you are not holding up yourself. So to me, that means you have to lose okay, contact so, with the turf or the grass. So there's which I could be wrong. people that are running away from you and you grab them while you're chasing them. How do you pull them down without unweighting yourself? I think you can pull them down. That's what I'm saying this whole time. The way, Can you read the unweighting part again? It says, uh, uh, B, unweights himself by swiveling and dropping his hips and or lower body, landing on and trapping the runner's legs. Well, at I, or think below the knee. I think they're in, in the, the reporter also said that they're only looking at a swivel version of this. So it seems like if you are like swiveling around in like, basically like using the momentum of your weight swiveled through the air to then you know if you basically if you swivel your body even if you have one foot on the ground or zero feet on the ground once you're off the ground your the gravity will pull you to the ground and whoever you're grabbing to the ground it seems like that's the version and here's here's why i do have a little bit of optimism here because this seems so subjective and difficult and hard to call like you keep saying they they screw up pass interference they screw up crap catches they screw up holding they screw up every call possible to me i don't see a way that the nfl can enforce or call these flags unless they they throw them only at the most 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 egregious versions of these whatever they're called hip drop tackles yeah. that seems to me to be maybe maybe the saving grace here because it's so hard to define. I don't understand what the hell they're saying. You don't seem to really understand it either. Maybe you do, and I just I, I don't know. It just doesn't seem like there's a very clean cut definition. But the fact they're referring to this swivel version and they have these words on weighting and twisting and body weight, whatever it all means, is that you can't be calling these willy nilly, especially if they're 15 yard penalties. I think it has to be something kind of like you know it when you see it uh that is the version we're getting rid of and i'm sure will be an adjustment i'm sure it will be annoying but hey I, I i think because it's so confusing you can't just call it on any tackle it has to be this like very specific body movement and maybe it won't be as bad as we think be because if, if they are calling it like letter of the law like the way this sentence is described then I think it's way too murky and subjective and could very much ruin the NFL totally. 
Um, but to me, it doesn't feel like that's the case, and they would never put a rule that that's that difficult to call, and that they are looking for a very, very specific version. I mean, well, of what a hip drop tackle is, and that once they see that, they will call it. And I don't think, I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't think we're going to be watching the game like, oh, that was a hip drop, hip drop tackle. That was obvious. I know drunk fans will be complaining and calling for it when there's a big play made against their team or if their player gets tackled or something, but it it's it, to me, it's like, there's the very specific instance. I don't no, think there is. I mean, it's the same thing that was roughing on. the passer. They tried to make it seem like, Oh, roughing the passer. You can't go high and him in the head Then You can't go low. Okay. And then you're getting people who are literally playing two hand touch. And we saw it. I forget which game it was, but there was an absolutely egregious one in the end of the year. Or if it was in the playoffs, whatever the hell it was where the guy literally just was like push and the guy still had the ball in his hand, passing or like roughing the passer. The NFL has just gotten so soft defensively. And I understand you're trying to protect people. But the thing is, at some point, you need to actually look and say, what is hurting people in the NFL? It's the fact that grown ass men are tackling other grown ass men. Doesn't matter how you do it, however you're tackling, you get hit enough times with the most perfect tackle ever. The person enforcing that tackle and the person receiving that tackle are still going to have long term permanent damage. That is a fact. I enjoy the NFL, okay? Like, I do. I'm not saying that I don't. But the thing is, if they want to keep changing these rules, eventually what it is getting to the point of, if you actually gave a shit about player safety, it would be two-hand touch. It would be flag football. It wouldn't be tackling because no matter how you do this, there's still going to be people who do it wrong. And so what? A 15-yard penalty to knock Lamar Jackson out of the game? Yeah, I'll take it. Whatever. Whatever. It's just, it's going to be too much. And what bothers me about this one though, is I feel like this one becomes so subjective that at the end of games, when there's huge moments on the line, we're going to see refs mess this up time and time again. And it's going to screw people out of more games than we're even used to as NFL fans. It's really frustrating. It really is. I think this is going to be a really bad one. I think this is one that is setting the NFL down a point of no return with what the future of the NFL looks like. If this goes away in two years, like the, like the past interference reviews did, then that's one thing. But I feel like where this is currently going and what this is saying, it's going down a point of no return. I don't think that they can go back on this rule. Any player safety rule, you can't go back on because then you're making the game more dangerous by removing the rule. The pass interference thing, they got rid of, we, it was the fans who all wanted the pass interference review because, because it was like, Oh my God, this was so egregious. Why can't we review? Why is this not a reviewable call? Some of these pass interference calls are like 40 yard penalties, 50 yard penalties. Um, and sure, let's let's review them. And then the NFL quickly realized, holy shit, these are so subjective. There's not really a great way to call these. We don't want to really bring attention to the fact that these plays are game changing plays and we don't know how to officiate them. Uh, so let's just not review them all together and we'll just call it in real time, which I still think is dumb. I still think reviewing pass interference should absolutely be a rule. But once you have a rule that's promoting player safety, there, you cannot, you cannot retreat. And like I said, I think that. they're screwed, man. I you do. I think that this that is back. leading them. How did this get approved? Did you just said the player association did not want they this. They didn't want it. So how did it get approved? Don't the they owners. need a vote? Don't the, the players owner have voted. Any say? No, it's only the owners. The owners make the decisions on the NFL rule changes. It's not the players association. So the owners shockingly ignored what the players wanted, claimed it was for player safety. So they can all sit around and go like this the whole day, patting themselves on the back. And it's not even what the players wanted. Mm. defense doesn't put people in seats anymore man it's offense 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 and the owners want crazy stats so they can use that as promotional tools to sell seats and sell whatever else they need to sell that's what the owners want the owners that that's what they want it's a fact right i mean i'm just i'm trying to find some sort of optimism or silver lining in that i think because it's such a weird rule and call that i think it's gonna I don't think you're going to see like five of these calls a game. Like everyone I think you are like, I really don't think you are I, I, 15 yard, 15 yard personal fouls. You're, we're going to see five of these a game. a game. I do not. I think they are looking for such a specific version of this tackle and that all the coaches have been sent memos and documents that fully go into every detail. There's probably legalese in there of like, this is what you need to train your players on focus on it in training camp. I'm sure they will do. Full on, they might have reps from you know the NFL from the league go to training camps 
and give them like three hour like conferences on exactly what this thing is, show the same videos, clips, studies to the refs. Their refs are training. They're probably being told this is what you're looking for. This is not what you're looking for. And I think they're going to button this up. This is a, you know, a billion dollar industry we're talking about here, multi-billion dollar industry. And for, for them to just be like, yeah, you can't tackle in this like really weird sort of subjective kind of way. Um, it's hard for me to sit here and buy that um, until I see it, because I don't, I don't think we have really seen any rule like this that is so unclear. So to me, it's got to be, it's got to be a specific thing they're looking for. Let's move on, Phil. Yeah. At first, uh, I want to say somebody document this. Somebody, somebody has to remind us after week one if there's five being called in every game. We need. And we need I think to it could, it could be something where there's, and this happens with every rule change. There will be more in week one, two, and three, and then you know weeks 15, 16, 17, 18. Um, then there are way, way fewer because the players have had time to see how the refs are calling it and have had time to adjust. And I think by the end of next season, uh, you, this is not a call that you are seeing every game. I think you'll see a lot of games where this they quietly get rid of it. Is that what you're saying? Um, with every, and this happens in all sports too. I mean, especially in the NBA, they always have like the officials this season have a point of emphasis. Mm -hmm. That's my, uh, Kevin Harlan voice. Uh, it's terrible. Dad. Yeah. Awful. They have a point of emphasis. He, wait, he's the play by play guy. It's more the color guy who I should even be doing. I don't know which color guy I want to pick, but anyway, they have a point of emphasis. And in the first two or three weeks of the NBA season, they will like egregiously call whatever the emphasis is. And it's to set the tone for the players and the players will kind of learn, okay, I really can't be doing this. Like, you know, I think it was one, you know, one season it's like, we're really gonna, we're really gonna call people on like moving picks. Like we're just not like, if your feet, both feet aren't planted, we are going to call you on a moving screen. And they would call it call it that way, you know, through October and November, maybe a little bit into December. By the time Christmas is over, right by the time January rolls around, um, there are fewer moving screens. The players learn, and then guess what? Even if there is a little bit of a moving screen that you would fall in the new letter of the law, the officials have realized, okay, the players are actually taking this rule change seriously, and you find this like happy medium. And I think that happens with a lot of rule changes. So I wouldn't be surprised if something like this happen where they're going to overcall it in the first few weeks but by the end of the season the players have adapted the refs have said okay we're backing off a little bit we're just going to call the really egregious versions which i think is the intent of the rule anyway and the whole point of the rule is to prevent injuries and keep players in the game which hey we can't really hate that intent even though if this execution is a little bit weird yeah so anyway um let's move on to the next one and we don't have to talk too long about this one because I don't want this film rule show to be an hour and a half. Will I don't I don't as much as as much as I love talking to you. We got. I mean, I don't have a lot to say on, on March. Monday. I actually think this other one's a good one. So, I think this one's actually more exciting. So this is the kickoff rule. It's the hybrid kickoff rule. Kickers are still going to be kicking from the same yard line, but then the players all line up at the opponent's forty, and then the play the opposing players will line up at the thirty-five. So they're running at each other, and then the ball can land somewhere between the twenty and the whatever. So there's less run up time. I do actually think that this is going to lead to more kickoff returns. Well, yeah, right it's here. like you basically get a penalty if you don't land it in like the landing zone. Is right? that official? Yeah, if you if so, there's a landing zone, and I think it's from like the twenty five. It's the to twenty the zero. It's the twenty to the zero to the goal line. Why did I say zero? I don't um, know. Basketball season, baby. Um, and then if you if you kick it if it lands in the end zone or goes out of the end zone without first hitting in the landing zone the other team gets the ball I think it's like the thirty five yard line is they're putting at the thirty now it's the, the 30. thirty is like the new touchback basically so this is incentivizing you to basically land it right at the goal line or the one yard line and yes we have Blake in here Blake is in here so Blake is watching Blake is and, dying to know <laughs> yes and we already corrected ourselves and so. That's your goal, and then you have to return it because you can't. I don't think you can fair catch it anymore. Like we had the fair catch for like two seasons, I think. Um, and that was basically there were no returns, people weren't returning. So now this rule is gonna give us way more kickoff returns, like way, 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 way more. I think that's so much better, and that's really fun. Plus, all the injuries on the kickoffs, the result is when you have basically 10 huge ass athletic grown dudes sprinting down the field at 10 other grown-ass dudes who are like waiting and then they start running up and it's literally like 
Gladiator or Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones when the armies are just and they just how are there not going to be injuries? It's it's the play that caused the most injuries per play in football or per I don't know per cap. I don't know what to say. It didn't cause the most injuries because it doesn't happen. It was the most game. per play though because like whenever there was most a kickoff return, there was almost an injury play. every time. Yeah, <laughs> most per type of play without a doubt. Um, and so this really eliminates that. The major major con, and I think there's only one. Uh, and if you can think of other cons, let me know. This. There's no way in this version of a kickoff play, and I could be wrong, but I don't think you can do an onside kick. There's no yeah, I valid don't know way. The onside kick there's rule. no valid way to do it. I think it says NFL think, teams will only be able to declare they want to pursue an onside kick in the fourth quarter of games. They can do it twice too. So you can do a traditional onside kick, but you can't do any more surprise onside kicks. So there's no um, surprise onside kick, which, which does suck, but they weren't using them sucks. that much. I mean, it never really happens, but it's still um, I've only been to one there. I've been to one Super Bowl in my lifetime. Um, and it was Saints Colts and Saints open up the second half with an onside kick and recover it. And it changes the entire tone of that game and might be the reason that they won a Super Bowl and that Drew Brees won his only ring. Um, that was a tremendous play, and we just that's not something that can ever and you can't kick an onside again. kick until the fourth quarter now. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, that is, Nightwalker that, says, though, as someone who was a kicker in high school, the new kickoff rule saves the play and a lot of special team coaches' jobs. No, that's true. I mean, now you now you need to work on your return game. I mean, now running plays is gonna be especially now, especially these first few seasons, there's probably really cool schemes. And I believe this did come from another league. The XFL, XFL. I believe, yeah, was, was running a version of this kickoff. So this has been tested. It's not like the NFL just came up with this out of nowhere. Uh, this has been something that's been studied and researched for years, maybe even decades at this point, or at least one decade. So um, I'm in. I'm in with this rule. I just think, you know, Onside kick that that kind of I wish there was some like how could you do an onside kick in this situation? It's kind of tricky. You kick so. it really short, and then all your players just turn around and run back and cover it because the other guys are 15, 20 yards downfield. So yeah, no, it down. doesn't make any sense. So, but I do think this is an improvement. I think it's and a I net, even though I like the uh, the onside kick. I think it's a net. Yeah, um, how many onside kicks you were talking about? How many times are they going to call this hip drop tackle penalty? How many times are we really seeing onside kicks? Not at a time when somebody needs an onside kick. We're not seeing right. all the problem. No, we're not. Um, so. so, yeah, I don't mind this rule. I think it's actually a good one. I think it'll be fun. Ryan51 says MLB season is tomorrow. We could start talking about the MLB in the summer. Well, I can't talk about the MLB yet. Yeah, we still got March Madness. Yeah, we'll talk like about baseball it always does this. And I mean, they did this. They like the Dodgers and Padres already played, already played two, games. two games in Korea. Like at a weird time, and like during March Madness, like and what like MLB? MLBs are still playing spring training, so you didn't even know if the games were on. I know. And then I was at a bar on, I believe it was Sunday, for some March Madness games, and there were people like, "Oh, can you turn on the Dodger game or turn it up or like gathering around the Dodger?" Because they had thought their season already started, and and the, these were now the games were now at Dodger Stadium. It's not like they're down in Arizona for the Cactus League. And like you could, I could tell the fans thought that these were regular season games because they already have you know wins and losses. They and they're LA won sports won. fans. Yeah, and they're LA sports Ooh, fans, yeah. and they're like wearing Dodger hats and stuff. And it's like, guys, this. I mean, hey, maybe they, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they were just like you know uh, there to watch their spring training game. But uh, yeah, that was confusing. The MLB is so bad at pretty much everything. They've they've the dumbest playoff format. In the world, yeah, we can talk about that. Later. We need to get into that now. Don't need to get into, into that now. But I agree with you 100. It is the dumbest playoff format in the world. But we can talk about that once we actually don't have. Once we don't have three really good topics, maybe next week we won't have as many topics, and then MLB will just pop in. Mm -hmm. Well, we guys talk about March Madness. Yes. Bro. Um. What's what's going? I mean, I I am someone who bet on every single money line underdog and it was an amazing first two days we i did it with a friend of mine and we were up like a ton of units like basically times 10 our yeah. money uh over over times 10 are our, our money in the first two days and then 
we actually ended up finishing winning about one unit each um, after it was all said and done because the favorites went 15 and one over the course. Clemson was the only one. Yeah, I got the it. course of Saturday and Sunday. And actually, we didn't place – our rules, we're going to place a bet on everything. But once we saw the games went on Saturday, we were like, we're not even going to bet on Northwestern money line. That's just throwing away money. So the mm. system – Probably you came out even, but we omitted one game. So we only went one in 14 on all the – Yeah. Well, got a banger, huh? So we actually did – it was a profitable four days, but, man, we were up, like, huge. Like, the most money well, we've ever been up gambling ever after, after the Thursday and Friday games. I got to say this, right? So the first two days were epic. Great two days of basketball. The weekend sucked. The weekend was brutal because not only were the favorites winning, they were dominating. Like they were just blowing the doors off of it. I mm-hmm. think there was what four or five single digit games out of 16. Yeah. Well, we did have three overtime games actually. In in every single overtime game, it was just like once you got to overtime, it was like, oh was blown out. Yeah, that's that's a good point because. On Saturday, just to go through this real quick, UNC beat Michigan State by 16. There was Tennessee versus Texas was a good game, although it wasn't a good game for most of the game. So that was one single-digit game, four-point game. We had Creighton versus Oregon wasn't a, a single-digit game. They Creighton won by 13, but that went to two overtime. So I'm going to That was that. double overtime and Creighton yeah. won by 13. And Oregon was up four with like 30 seconds left or something yeah like Oregon and had that in it. the bag that one was good nc state oakland was overtime in oh, a six that was game. great that was great so on saturday we had three on sunday <laughs> houston a&m went to overtime was great but was honestly a terrible game until the final minute and honestly seconds. houston was up nine with like 50 10 no they were up 10 left. minutes with a minute 14 left 10 with a minute 14 left that's it yeah it was it was in such a ridiculous comeback but then you're going, oh my god, this is insane! But then I'm like, oh, I've been here before, man. The the underdogs yeah. in overtime have not been getting it done. And then Clemson, uh, Baylor was an eight point game, although Clemson was dominating for most of that game. It got close at the end, and then they ended up holding on. And Marquette, Colorado, was the best game of the weekend, or the best game of Sunday. And Will and I were podcasting with Bruce, and so neither one of us watched it anyway. So six of sixteen games. Six of 16, but only five of those 16 were actually single digits because the Creighton-Oregon game obviously went to whatever. My biggest takeaway from this weekend was, obviously, the bracket I talked about here on this podcast was absolute dog shit. But, man, I've never seen such bad free throw shooting from good free throw shooters. In the tournament every year, players go cold or bad free throw shooting ends up costing teams games. But in the Auburn game, Every player who stepped to the line at the end of that game was like 75 plus percent from the free throw line. And they just bricked every single one of them. And they lost by two. Also, the the Auburn player who decided to go out of his way to elbow somebody like, I hope you're proud of yourself. You should be really, really not ashamed at all. Like what a dumbass three minutes into the game. And I'm sorry, I get he's a college athlete. You're not supposed to be mean. But like you went out of your way to try to injure somebody with your elbow jogging down the court. Put your ego on check for five seconds, man. You'd be, you would have probably made it to the Sweet 16 because San Diego State's not very good. So that was just ridiculous. But just bad free throw. Baylor could have beaten Clemson. They were getting every foul call down the end. They couldn't make any free throws. Texas AM shot like 60% from the free throw line and still went to overtime against Houston. But it's like, what in the world was going on with those games? And that was really where the upsets came from. The upsets came from bad free throw shooting more than like really good underdog teams. And I think that's why the second round wasn't all that exciting. Yes, it wasn't. It really, it really wasn't. So I do want to bring it was up. Bad. But can, bring look, up can we look right? forward though? Like we, we yes, Thursday, or Thursday, Friday was fantastic. Unbelievable. Um, and then, I mean, the end of the day, Friday was kind of, the middle Can I of the show day. You a bracket real quick, Will. Sure. I think this is worth presenting. So obviously, we all we're all going to insert multiple brackets, right? Mm. So here's one that I did for another pool. Can you see it? There it is. So look at my Sweet Sixteen or my Elite Eight: UConn, Illinois, Duke, Marquette, <laughs> North Carolina, Arizona, Gonzaga, Creighton. 
So I have my whole Elite Eight still intact. I was so bad <laughs> in the first round that I literally could not win that pool. <laughs> Yeah, because have, you also went with UConn. You're not going to win. Yeah, but look at no, but look at my other side. So this was UConn, but when I picked UConn to win it all, I took them beating Duke. I had Gonzaga making the Final Four. Like I went against Houston. I went against Houston and Purdue over there. But the person who is – somebody's beating me by a specific amount right now, like five points or something where I can't catch them, and they have Duke in the final as well. Oh, which that's is your why problem. I can't do it. Yeah. That's what killed me. Because everybody else, if that happens, I will finish second by a lot. But it's just crazy to me. I got 12 of the Sweet 16. I got all I could get all eight of the Elite Eight, all four of the Final Four champion right. My opening round in that one, Will, I went nine, uh, what was it, 19 of 36. I need everyone's help here on my survivor pool. This is a Survivor podcast, so we are talking Survivor. Yes, right if now. you're over here, put your put your options in. Will needs help. He so basically, I I, you can't use a team more than one. So I did Iowa State, Baylor, Illinois, Bama. And this is not per round; it's per day. So basically, now you only have a, uh, there's only a few teams left. And so when I'm looking at this side, this is the left side of the bracket. I can't take Illinois. Or Iowa State. I've already taken them both. So if I'm going to pick that, I would have to go Connecticut or San Diego. But then my problem there is that I can, can't can pick that Elite Eight matchup because that Elite Eight matchup would be the winner of Connecticut or UConn versus San Diego in Illinois, Iowa State. No matter what, if I pick UConn or San Diego State, I cannot have the winner um, of that Elite Eight matchup, which you want to save. You want to save all your options. So the, then then it becomes going to the West. And I've already used Alabama. So if I pick North Carolina, then I know I'll have the winner of Clemson, Arizona available to take. But obviously, that would mean North Carolina has won and is playing them. So who do I go with here? Or do I just go with Arizona and Clemson, pick Arizona or Clemson? I think that's actually going to be a close game. And then no matter what, I'll just take North Carolina and make so the four. What's so funny I don't is know you what I do. Ryan51, who says San Diego State for the upset. But like you said, you can't pick San Diego State because if you pick San Diego State, then I then I can't pick anyone in that elite eight matchup, and I need at least I want to keep as many options open now. Well, because could, then what you run into the problem of will is you can't pick. Well, I guess in the final four you would have both teams are playing on the same day, but still you wouldn't be able to pick the whole left side. By the right, time. and I think once you get to the final four, I don't think you need to pick both sides. So it's basically I will. This is for Thursday. It will be these teams. I'll need to pick one of these teams again on Saturday. What I, I would do? I won't need to pick two of them, though. I'll just need to pick one. So I guess I could technically pick UConn, and then, look, the East is done, and then I whoever is in the West, I will pick one of those teams on, um, I don't know. Yeah, this I don't think guy, it's smart, Ryan though, because you want to use your Final Four. I, I would need to, I'm would i going to need to use one of these in the Final Four. So this is I'm in a really tricky spot. Ryan says do Arizona then, but the problem is if you take Arizona and North Carolina gets upset, you have to take the winner of UConn San Diego State. And then if that team goes on to win in, in the national championship, you can't win. So whoever right. you think, if you think UConn's going to win the title, you have to save UConn at this point. I would probably take North Carolina, then take the winner of Arizona Clemson to beat North Carolina, which I think is very doable. And then you have UConn for the final four in the championship. Cause I mean, I know San Diego State's not as good as they were last year. UConn beat the doors off of San Diego State in the championship game last year. I think mm. UConn's going to beat San Diego State very easily, so they're going to move on. But, like, so you could pick UConn, but then you can't pick UConn again, so you're screwed because then at Final Eight, if you No, I can't. Win, I really yeah. can't pick UConn now just because I think they are going to get at least the Final Four. I would I think take UNC. I, I could go UNC – and then they need to win against Bama, and then I can pick Clemson or Arizona. I also said originally that Alabama would lose to Charleston. Charleston shot terribly in that game. They shot so bad. They still scored 97 points. Yeah. Like, North Carolina could score so I don't many know. Points. Arizona right here is definitely the safest pick. Because then I can have Arizona. They're the favorite. They win. And then I'll, I'll just take North Carolina uh, against Unless Arizona. Clemson pulls it, man. I mean, Clemson's, Clemson's – I don't know. That good. one's tough. And then – and then um, looking at the Friday pick, I think I've got that. I have way more options here. Oh, my God. You have everybody available. I have everybody's 
So I'm just picking Marquette and just picking the safest thing because I think Creighton or Tennessee uh, is going to – I don't know. They're going to – I don't know. It's, it's it, actually a really hard day. Gonzaga might be the best pick that day. Yeah, but I'm not going to pick against Purdue right now. I'm just saying um, NC State's hot, man. I know you were saying, oh, it gave all these teams time to cool down. NC State and Oregon didn't look cooled down when they went and played their first two games. I know, but Marquette's looked good. They blew the doors off. They didn't blow the doors off Colorado, but they pretty much hit. No, dude, pretty Colorado handled. almost beat them. I at the very end, it was the free throw game. No, no, no I was no, no, no. I was Colorado's watching that. Don't worry. Um, I mean, should I take Houston over Duke? I don't know. None of these. There's no obvious pick on Friday. That's the problem with the favorites, and I actually think that Thursday, Friday is going to be two great days of college basketball. It will be very good because they're also like NC State is the only double digit seed left. NC State's the hottest team in the country right now. Like that's a scary team. Oh. So these are great games, especially. All right. Friday, so what? Friday's so if game. I don't take Marquette, who am I? All right. Here, let let's do this real quick since we have the games here, and let's let's not let's let's kind of do our own little ranking here of of the sixteen teams that are left, and we can do it real quick. We don't have to go and give our reasoning for all of them. I don't. Uh. Like if you were, if you were looking at this right now, are you still saying Houston and Purdue are the one seeds? I would say Purdue is actually looking way better than I thought because they've they've always been like the scary choking team. Mm -hmm. But I feel like now that they're into the second weekend, they're kind of they've kind of gotten over their flaw, and now they can just focus on being a good team, playing against honestly playing against better competition probably helps them in a way. Like playing a team like Gonzaga, um, that I think they can. I think Purdue still, yeah, I think they're still a one seed, and then Houston. Yeah. Houston's looked pretty dirty. I don't know. Who would you who would you put as the ones? I mean, UConn's looked fantastic. I mean, they played UConn's Stetson. the overall number one. I mean, like, Stetson and Northwestern, I know, isn't much, but they've dominated. If I um, was to do this, like if I was to actually rank like who I think the best teams are, I think UConn is the clear, 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 clear number one. And then I actually think that Houston's probably still the number two. Houston got in crazy foul trouble. Crazy, crazy, crazy foul trouble. Like that was insane in that game. They had four different players or five different players foul out. That was crazy. I actually think that the way these teams are playing right now, I think that Gonzaga might be the third best team left in this tournament. Yeah, I, I think Purdue Gonzaga is going to be such a good game. I don't want to pick either of those teams. Yeah, I would actually say they're probably the third best team in the tournament. And then I think Tennessee and Creighton are both very even. I think this is the – these teams that are in front of us right now are the better teams left in the tournament. I really do. I think Iowa State looked a little phony baloney. Uh, they looked really good when they blew Houston out in the Big 12 championship game, but they didn't look very good in either one of their games. And Washington State played them tough from start to finish. That was nerve-wracking. San Diego State pretty much just had an easy streak there. UAB wasn't that good. They still only beat them by four. And then, like – that Yale team that beat Auburn is horrible. It was a horrible basketball team. Auburn just could not have choked that away any more than they did. Um, Alabama, kind of like whatever on. Illinois has looked better than I thought they would, but then at the same time, Illinois beat a really, really bad Duquesne team that just shot – like BYU just could not shoot that day, so that was their problem. Um, and Illinois beat Moorhead State, but Moorhead State hung around in that one. Duke has looked good. They beat the doors off of James Madison. I mean, they really kill James Madison, and James Madison looked great in their game. And Purdue, like you said, they've also they've they've looked legit after whatever the hell they did last year. So I just think right now. So what am I doing on Friday? Do I go? Do I go with Houston? And then does that? Oh no! Oh no! Oh, he's done. He already did it. So it's do over. I do I go with Houston? And then Houston wins. And then if I my next pick of that day, I just pick. NC State or Marquette, whoever wins, or I don't even pick, I just pick Purdue or Gonzaga over the winner of Creighton, Tennessee, knowing that though that's probably yeah, maybe the best you team. almost pick the can you pick the Tennessee Creighton game? I could, but who am I? No, but I'm asking that's, you, like, can you literally will Arbuckle? Can you pick the Tennessee Creighton game? I would pick Creighton. Would you really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, both of those teams are skittish. Tennessee hasn't looked like themselves and Creighton. Damn, that game against Oregon was nuts. And they almost lost to a team where only two do, players. Do you really think NC State half. is going to give Marquette problems? Because Marquette's yeah. pretty dirty. Can I just say this real quick? 
for the last three years, all I've heard is that the ACC is down, the ACC is down, the ACC is down. And every time we advance past the first weekend, the ACC always has the most teams left, even though they barely get anybody in. It's just insane. I mean, it really is. Two years ago, two years ago, three of the final eight were the ACC. Duke and Carolina played each other in the final four. And then Carolina went on to the final. Last year, Miami went to the final four. They were the only power five team in the final four. And now this year, the ACC gets five teams in. Everybody will be like, oh, well, Virginia sucked. Virginia shouldn't have been the fifth team. It should have been Wake Forest or Pitt. Honestly, both of them could have gotten in. And guess what? We're sitting here, and the ACC has four of the final 16 teams left in the tournament, most out of any conference out there. Where's the Mountain West? Oh, that's interesting. Just San Diego State. But, yeah, let's keep putting in those teams because they're so good. They're so worthy. Like, every year the ACC is down, and it's just insane how that narrative is always wrong. And now you have NC State who wins the title and isn't even that good. And they're just, I mean, they've looked very good in their first two games. And I know Oakland isn't that good of a team, but still it's like they beat Texas Tech, who was a solid Big 12 team. And then Oakland was shooting lights out, man. They didn't have time to cool off. So you went and picked Creighton. I'm I'm going with, I mean, it still could change. I have until Friday. I can actually yeah. see how it plays out Thursday to see kind of what my options are. Um. But yeah, I think I gotta I gotta go with Arizona. There's not really another pick. I gotta pick Arizona or Clemson. I have to pick that game basically because then I can pick UNC and I want to leave UConn for like literally the final four of the national championship game. And that's a big pool. That payout is like it's like over ten grand if you win. So. Oh my god. Um. Oh yeah. And the Big East. Jake Bernstein says Big East for the snubs this year, not Mountain West. No, no, no. Mountain West got way too many teams in. That's what I'm saying. It was like Mountain West is good. Mountain West is good. SEC sure looked good in the first two rounds too, huh? Mm -hmm. Um. It's just crazy how every year the ACC feels like they have to battle uphill, and the Big East too because they're not a football conference. And it's like, dude, just like watch these teams play. I mean, there's no way a team that beat UConn should be in the tournament. I don't care who they were. And I think St. John's beat UConn. So like, there should be more Big East teams in. And the ACC should have gotten more teams in. And it's time to stop pretending that these other conferences are like as good just because they beat up on each. It's just, it's such nonsense. Anyway, um, because it's year after year. That's what annoys me is like an ACC person. Somebody went to Miami. Will, you did too. Mm -hmm. It's aggravating that every year it's the exact same storyline of ACC's having a down year. And then the ACC always does the best in the tournament. So how are they having a down year or do they not have a big media deal with CBS? That's what it's starting to feel like a little bit to me. I'm just saying, not to be a conspiracy theorist, but whoa, the Mountain West, whoa, whoa. Mountain West and the SEC both have deals with CBS. I'm just saying. Um, so maybe maybe their numbers are just a little bit better um, because their their gameplay certainly isn't. Certainly, certainly isn't. And that's funny. Ryan 51 said it before I could even get it in. Mountain West is a huge CBS deal. That's why they always get more teams in. It's crazy. It's funny how that works. Um, so the world goes round, kids. ACC's got to play game. So, Will, real quick, let's let's pick let's pick the games. We don't have to go against the spread or anything like that. Let's just pick the games. Give us your new Final Four. Who's your champion after week number one? Um, is there a stone cold lock you have for these days? We'll start no. off with Thursday. I don't feel good about anything here. We'll look at the matchups on Thursday. Um, UConn's going to beat San Diego State. Illinois and Iowa State doesn't matter to me because they're gone to my pool. Um, let's take Iowa State there. Um, and then, you know what? I think Alabama is going to beat North Carolina. Let's go. That's the upset. Um, after I just said everything about how the ACC is always underrated and the SEC is always over. And then, well, let's go with Clemson. It's going to be Clemson. There, there will be an ACC team. It's, it's not going to be Alabama, Arizona, but it will be one of those two. I really, I have no feel for this right now. It, it, these, these matchups are the most difficult sweet 16 matchups we've had in a very long time. Maybe because ever. Because yeah. of the lack of upsets, because the favorites went 15 in one again, 15 in one on the over the course of Saturday and Sunday, we have the best teams left. We don't have Yale, we don't have yeah. Oakland, we don't have Oregon as, as great as they looked. We have one double digit seed, and that yeah, double Grand digit Canyon. seed is playing out of their minds right now. So there's not I that's why I'm like, but I could make dumb picks. I don't have any insider analysis. You're the best. Do you think Arizona? Guy. Do you think Arizona has a uh, an advantage in that region now because they're playing in Los Angeles and they're Arizona and we have Clemson, um, North Carolina, and Alabama as the other three teams? Sure. That doesn't seem authentic, Will. I think so. I mean, sure, why not? It's it's March Madness. I mean, you're traveling. 
you're finding out who you play like you know 48 hours before i know they have a little bit more time this week but still this isn't this is madness baby you just gotta yeah. get, get on a plane i actually run some plays you gotta hit your free throws hit your three-point shots you gotta go on some runs you gotta stop some runs that's that's the name of the game. Have you considered oh, coaching basketball? Coins. It's flipping coins at this point. Especially Have you considered coaching? Because that was pretty good. You sold me. Um, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna look at this real quick. I think I like Clemson to cover against Arizona, and for the sake of it, because I want the ACC to just flip everybody off, I'll take Clemson to beat Arizona. Seven and a half, though. That's a lot of points. Kind of like that for Clemson. Uh, wow. UConn, I think it's gonna kill up too, because it was at like yeah. four and a half. When yeah, it opened. Yeah, I think, and remember, Clemson was an underdog to 11th seed New Mexico in game one, which is why I picked New Mexico, because why would they ever make an 11th seed favorite over um, whatever, a six seed? And Clemson beat the shit out of them. So it's like, all right, guys, let's let's stop just saying, like, the Mountain West teams are good just for the sake of it. Um, so anyway, I think Clemson beats Arizona. UConn's going to beat the doors off San Diego State. That's minus 10 and a half. That's not mm -hmm. enough. North Carolina, Alabama. I like Carolina there. Also, the totals at 173 and a half. Now, remember my opening round where I said Bama versus Charles. I said that's the easiest over ever. And then I also took the over again. I thought the over would hit again in Alabama versus Grand Canyon. Those teams should have hit the over. They just shot 35% from the field. They still scored like 135 points, which is insane. Um, so I like the over in that one, but I think Carolina wins it. And then I will also take Iowa State to beat Illinois. I'll take UConn to beat Iowa State. And then I think. I actually think Clemson might be your final four team, man. They are playing love that. out right now. I would love that. Um, let's go to the Friday games. I think I think the one thing though that can be said from that side of the bracket, UConn is going to the is going to the championship game. That's what I feel very strongly that UConn's going to the championship game. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, let's do Friday real quick, Will. It's right here. NC I don't State. Know. I'm Marquette. Go Houston. Let's 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 go NC State. At ACC, baby. Duke Here's and the NC spread. State get it done. Let me tell you the spreads real quick for these games. So Marquette by six and a half, Purdue by five and a half, Houston by four and a half, Tennessee two and a half. Mm -hmm. You know, I actually probably like, I think I like, I think NC State's going to beat Marquette. I think Gonzaga is going to beat Purdue. And then I think Houston and Tennessee will both win. I think Creighton's going to win. I think Creighton's built for it. These are great games, man. These they really, really are. are. It's tough. I mean, I'm like, I might push this back to Marquette or like put it. I might go Purdue. I don't yeah. know. This is such a – this Survivor I – mean, if everyone's not done a Survivor pool for March Madness, it's really fun because the strategy is so layered. And it's not like the NFL where you have all these – You almost want to pick like a, a six seed to win the first round because you're – like a six seed. Yeah, that's what actually the most picked team of the first round was – BYU. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So well, I mean, but honestly, after you, watch Duquesne, after you watched Duquesne play against Illinois and you saw that even with BYU starting what 0 for 10 from the field, they still lost by four. It's like that's just a the, a team that just did not show up, man. They just mm -hmm. did not show up the day they needed to. Um it's the tournament, so, baby. So if I did that, I would then have Houston going to the final four. And I'm gonna I'm gonna ride Gonzaga. I actually think we're gonna get a UConn versus Gonzaga final. I think wow. Gonzaga is freaking hot right now i know they beat the crap out of a kansas team that was hurt in the second half they just blew them away that was an insane second half because that game, the first Samford half of that game was so so good i was I like yeah here we go this yeah. is then it was good basketball too it was good defense good offense but, like the talent level was high and then gonzaga comes out in the second half and it's not even a game they well the thing was you like saw 20. it then you saw it two nights before when samford played kansas Kansas was up 22 in that game, but because they had no depth with McCuller being out and they only had six guys, Sanford came all the way back and should have won that basketball game. That block was the cleanest block you're ever going to see. Oh, that was such bullshit. That was one of the worst calls ever. And so I think like Sanford showed the game plan, which was just stick with them for a half because they're going to get tired. And that's exactly what happened. And Gonzaga blew them away. But Purdue looked really good. I'm not really, I wasn't overly impressed with Utah State, but. I just think like Gonzaga Purdue, the winner of that game, I think is going to go to the championship game. I think Houston will choke because Houston always. Chokes. All right. So I'm not picking that game for my pool. No. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So I got your probably, your safest there. bet probably is Marquette, but I just think NC State could win that. They could win. I'm feeling Creighton, man. I really have some good Creighton vibes. Yeah. 
you just watch that Oregon game and watch those two guys just put up like 40 points in the second mm-hmm. half and literally nobody else on that team could score. It was so pathetic. It was a fun game. It was a really fun game. Oh, I was great. rooting for Oregon because yeah. I had money line underdog, baby. Yeah. But um, yeah. yeah. All right. That will, uh, I think that wraps it up. That's three big topics. Wow. I know. What a day. What a day. That was a lot of fun. Hope you guys all enjoyed this podcast. If you did, please give us a like, give us a subscribe. Let us know who your picks are for this crazy sweet 16. This is one of the best sweet 16s we've, uh, we've had in a long time, even though I always love the chaos and stuff. When you look at these games, they're all coin flips and that's fun with the exception of UConn. If UConn loses, that's just going to be nuts. That's going to be so unexpected, but uh, thank you all so much. We're going to be live in two hours Two no three and a half, four hours with our survivor episode thing. But mm-hmm. Hope you're enjoying the Phil and Mill show because we're enjoying doing it. At least I was. I don't know if Will did yet. He hasn't texted me to say whether he liked it or not. But anyway. Yeah, it's okay. Bye, everybody. See ya.